Welcome all. My name is Noel Jackson. I'm Associate Professor of Literature at MIT. David Thorburn, the Communications Forum Director, is unfortunately unable to join us tonight. It is, however, my great pleasure to introduce what happens to be our last MIT Communications Forum event of the term, News or Entertainment, the Press in Modern Political Campaigns. Uh, our distinguished speakers are here now, but it's my job to, and my pleasure, to introduce to you our moderator for tonight's discussion, Seth Mnookin, sitting right here to my right. Seth co-directs MIT's graduate program in science writing. He's a contributing editor at Vanity Fair. He's the author most recently of The Panic Virus, the true story behind the vaccine autism controversy, which won the National Association of Science Writers 2012 Science and Society Award. He's also the author of the 2006 New York Times bestseller, Feeding the Monster, How Money, Smarts, and Nerve Took a Team to the Top, about the Boston Red Sox, and 2004's Hard News, The Scandals at New York Times and Their Meaning for the American Media. And in 2002 and 2003, he was a senior writer at Newsweek. It's my pleasure to welcome Seth, but before I do, I wanted simply to uh, call your attention to the screen behind me and to the MIT, uh, the eighth annual MIT uh, Media in Transition uh, Conference. Uh, uh, on which I'm serving on the organizing committee, uh, Nick Monfort and uh, James Parody sitting in the audience are uh, as well on the organizing committee for this. I think we put together a great conference. Uh, registration for the conference is uh, free, but we do ask that you register in advance. So uh, please um, uh, save the date and, uh, and we'll hope to see you there. Uh, but it's my pleasure now to introduce Seth Mnookin. Seth. Um, thank you very much. So I'm going to uh, now I will introduce uh, Mark and Tanahasi, um, and then we're going to spend somewhere between 40 minutes and, and an hour um, talking among the three of us, and then we'll devote the second half of the forum to questions from all of you. Um, so uh, if something comes up during our conversation that you want us to expand on, uh, write it down or remember it, and we will definitely have a chance to do that. Um, uh, Ta-Nehisi uh, Coates is, has been, for this academic year, a member of our MIT family, which we're very excited about. He's a 2012-2013 Martin Luther King Jr. visiting scholar. Um, he is also a senior editor at The Atlantic, where he both blogs and uh, writes regularly for the magazine. Um, and one of his pieces from last year, uh, Fear of a Black President, is uh, right now a finalist for the National Magazine Award. Is that May 2nd? Yes. 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 So um, uh, everyone send positive vibes to New York City on May 2nd. Uh, um, he's the author of a, uh, a memoir that came out in 2008 yep. um, called The Beautiful Struggle, A Father, Two Sons, and an Unlikely Road to Manhood. Um, and uh, that's about his experiences growing up in Baltimore with his father and brother. Um, Mark McKinnon. Uh, is a senior advisor at Hill and Knowlton. Is that right? Knowlton? Is that how you pronounce it? All right. Strategies. Um, he's, he's probably best known as a political consultant, um, a job that he had in the 90s um, and then left and then came back in the 2000s, <coughs> um, uh, advised uh, the second President Bush on his uh, two presidential campaigns, um, and as well as Senator McCain. And uh, two years ago started um, uh, the, uh, an organization called No Labels, which is designed to foster more um, uh, better working relationships between the two political parties. Um, and there have been some, some No Labels successes just within the past 24 hours. Um, in, in terms of the, uh, the gun legislation. Uh, he also is a regular columnist for the Daily Beast um, and the London Daily Telegraph. And were the, you were the editor of the, <laughs> of the, uh, of the paper at uh, University of Texas Austin. What is it, the Daily Texan? Uh -huh. So um, he is 
both a member of the media and uh, has also worked in politics. So I wanted to start by getting a little bit of, of both of your backgrounds, um, just because they're in their own ways uh, a little bit unusual. Um, Mark, I know you uh, spent some time working with Chris Christofferson. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're really digging up the past here. <clears throat> Yeah, I, uh, I actually. I mean, digging out the past means the second paragraph on Wikipedia. So. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I had I, my career kind of is in three different buckets, I guess. The first one was uh, I was in the music business, and I I love music. I grew up on music, and had uh, there was an old folk singer named Judy Collins. who was my babysitter when I was growing up, and so I fell in love with music really early on, and then. Was this to was that to supplement her singing career? That or? was kind of before she was, she before, okay. before she was taken off. Her father was a piano teacher in Denver, and uh, and she before she took off, she that's how she supplemented. And uh, and then I uh, I loved writing. I loved I loved writing generally. I mean that that was kind of my entree into politics, journalism, and. <laughs> Uh, music and uh, so I, I started a little band in high school and which attracted the attention of Chris Christofferson who tried to produce our band and get us a record deal which didn't happen which is not surprising if you heard the tapes but I, I got so inspired by it all uh, that I ran away from home in high school and hitchhiked to Nashville and uh, and then just banged around Nashville for four or five years and, and he was very generous and let me live in his apartment and sort of tolerated me because I, I really was not a very good songwriter but uh, but I had a lot of fun it was a great thing to do as a young teenager kicking around Nashville and then I ended up in Texas uh, playing at a folk festival realized after a couple of years of then I discovered Austin moved there and then played around there for a while and then at a time I guess one of the times I really exercised some judgment in my life was realizing my musical limitations and realize that on the on the arc that I was on, I was going to end up at the uh, Cambridge Holiday Inn as the second act when I was 50 years old. Right. And there was just a lot of great talent around, so I, I decided that I'd try a little higher education, and uh, <clears throat> then I got into journalism and was covering, uh, writing a lot about politics, because I liked politics and wrote about and this it. This was when you were in college. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then, which I'd started a little later in life, but, um, and then uh, a local state senator ran for the U.S. Senate, and I, uh, I've been covering him, and I went over and volunteered into his campaign, and uh, had an exciting primary, then got killed in the general election, but that's when I discovered you can fail upwards in politics, and right. went to work for the governor, and then, then got the campaign bug, and went to Louisiana, and then moved to New York, and worked for a, a, one of the gurus of our business in New York, and worked races all around the country and around the world. And, and that, when you say the governor in Texas, that was Ann Richards. This actually, it was before that. This was Mark right. White. Okay. Uh, who, who, who was also a Democrat. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and I had a, I had, so I started off as an anarchist banning the student government <laughs> initially uh, at the University of Texas. And then uh, in Texas at the time, there was only the Democrat, there were, it was the two parties, but it was a Democratic Party and the conservative Democratic Party. There was right. no Republican Party, which is astonishing when you think how quickly things have changed there. In 1990, when Ann Richards was elected, and I worked for Ann Richards, uh, every constitutional office in the state, and there are 18 or 24 of them, I forget, every one of them was a Democrat. Today, all of them are Republican. Anyway, uh, so I, got, I came back to Texas, started a firm, worked in politics, worked for Ann Richards. Uh, then and as you, now in the 90s. Yeah, and as you noted, I kind of bailed out of politics for a little while, and that was when she ran against George W. Bush. Uh, in 96. In, in 94. Okay. And uh, uh, so I stayed. So did, you, did, you, did you leave? Did you leave politics at that point because you were conflicted about that race? Or? No, no. I, I, I was actually, <laughs> believe it or not, I was concerned about the partisan nature of politics and just had kind of tired of it and uh, and just was pursuing some other. I was working on some education reform efforts and I, I was just kind of burned out at the time and and then I. Got to, and then on this education efforts, through that, I was got George W. Bush, and I met him, and got him interested in some charter school things, and then got to know him, and then... This is after he was governor. This is after he was elected in 94, and then 
I was kind of evolving in my life and be, had become a little bit more conservative and had issues with the Democratic Party. And I liked his compassionate conservative message. And he was pushing, at the time, you know, he was very uh, vocal about things like immigration reform and education reform, which were two very passionate issues for me at the time. And we became friends, and then he asked me to help him in his reelect in 1998. And his and the lieutenant governor, who was a Democrat, uh, a legendary Democrat and mentor to him, asked me if I would consider it. And, and he endorsed Bush over his own godson, who was running against Bush at the time. Anyway, so uh, I, I got aboard with uh, with George W. Bush in his reelect, and then did both the presidential right. campaigns. And so, uh, Tanasi, you um, uh, tell us a little bit about your path to journalism. I know you started at Washington City Paper uh, about a little over a decade ago. Is that right? No, I wish it was a little over a decade ago. Uh, it's been uh, almost 17 years, so a little under two decades. A little sorry. under two decades ago. Um, wow, I am getting old. Um, I, I was in college in D.C. at Howard University. Getting, I am old. Um, I was in college at Howard University. I started in journalism when I was 20 years old. And um, I wanted to be a poet before that. Um, I was not a very good poet. Um, <laughs> you do have a knack for choosing careers that don't offer a lot of financial stability. I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. I, I had that um, you're not going to make much money face. Um, and, and I knew that, that, you know, I was born with that cloud. I was not a good student in school. Um, so I, I knew that, you know, you know there, was, there weren't, you know, riches out there waiting for me. Right. So I, I um, but I did like to write. I did like to write no matter how, you know, whether I was good at it or bad at it. I did, I did enjoy writing. And um, when I was 20, I had a friend who I knew who was a much better poet than me who had interned at uh, Washington City Paper. Uh, the editor was all of our mutual friends everybody's mutual friend, David Carr. <clears throat> and um, I sent him a little chapbook of really bad poetry. And somehow that convinced him that I should be a journalist. <laughs> and that, that, that's it. That's my career. That really is it. I mean, and, I never turned around after that. And so when at, at age 20, so you left college, made a decision to leave Howard I, You know, I, it's funny, because when I got there, I knew that I shouldn't be there. It was pretty clear to me I did not belong there. And when I got that job. For what reason? Because I had never been good at school. And I, you know, I love to read, but I wanted, it's funny, I'm having, I have to, a conference with my, with my son's teachers tomorrow. And it's like a mirror image of exactly who I was. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, How old is your son? He's uh, 12. He'll be 13. This year, and he's just like me. Um, but I, I, you know, I love to read. I wanted to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. And the cool thing about journalism was that's that was pretty much the job description. I mean, you did have deadlines, but you had to pitch stories. It had to be your idea. And you know, I think journalism works at its best when the person executing the journalism is fanatically curious. And I did have that. I had that as a child. You know. Um, and you know, that's pretty much carried over. I, I could not believe that somebody would pay you to do journalism. Like the question that you were really, really burning to answer, um, if you could you know, convey that burning to an editor, you know, they would say, OK, go answer the question, and I'll see you in a week or two. And that was like amazing to me. And then they give you money. Um, I was giving people money. I was giving a college money. Right. You know, and I couldn't really answer the burning questions that, that I wanted. I'm making a great appeal for MIT's writing program right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that just, that really, that, that bugged me out. I, I couldn't believe that. So I knew I should have left when I was 20. I, it took about, it was like a bad divorce. You know, it took, you know, about another year. I was in and out, on and off. And eventually I finally pulled the trigger and said, OK, this, this is where I am. And that was it. That was my life. And so uh, starting out, did you, you were in Washington, obviously. Right. Um, uh, were you, and, and 2000, that, that uh, you were in Washington uh, then in the late 90s and early 2000s, right? I left like 2000. I left about 2000. 99, 2000. Yeah. So certainly there was a lot going on politically yes. during those years. Yes. Did you, were you drawn at all to covering politics or were you interested in covering politics? I wanted to cover music, but working for David, you had to cover politics. You just, you had to cover local DC. You just did or else you wouldn't work there. It was that simple. Um, you could write about music too, but you really, really, there were very few people who just got the luxury of being already <laughs> folks. And that uh, was, uh, frankly, uh, a great contribution. Because I think if left up to me, I would never have learned how to report. 
Um, but you just, you had to, you had to. And I think, um, I, I still think, you know, um, the sheer challenge of walking up to someone who you do not know with a pen and a pad and asking a question, it, it, I mean, it's one of the scariest things in the world. Um, but it's so important to be able to do and to be able to master and to put yourself out there and to understand um, that just because you're curious, no one owes you anything. You know, they don't have to be nice to you. Um, and I learned that in D.C. Because right. <laughs> this was D.C. I mean, you had to cover D.C. I mean, this was not uh, uh, Washington. You know, this was local D.C. This was local, DC. Poli this this was local metro politics, yeah. Right, right. Um, one thing that, uh, that we're going to come back to is the ways in which political reporting and coverage of politics has changed over the last 15 or 20 years. And um, it, it, it strikes me that both of you are in an interesting position because you are both of this world, but uh, you only in since 2008, um, uh, and you were not writing about journalism, and for the most part, I guess you are now somewhat, but um, over the last 15 or, or so years, have seen this evolution as insider outsiders. Right. Um, and that's, that's something that I, I, I want to come back to. But we'll, we'll, I want to also make sure that we get to the present with both of you until then. So um, uh, you went to, uh, you worked for President Bush. Um, we were talking earlier, um, and I think you didn't remember, but on election night in 2000, the, the first time that Bush was announced as the winner, Mark and I were standing next to each other um, in Austin. Uh, I was covering um, the campaign, and I uh, was with Jake Tapper, who is now the CNN. Yeah, he's Washington got his own show on CNN. Yeah. Right. Show, yeah. No, he has a, yeah, he's got a show. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, Jake Tapper, another person who got his start around the same time Probably. with David Carr and City Washington Paper. City Paper, yes. By the way, for those of you, you may, you may all know who David Carr is, but for those of you who may not, he's this legendary New York Times uh, reporter who reports on broadly media technology, cultural zeitgeist. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. and. Uh, a, a connective tissue for a lot of people in our business, and, and he's going to be here next week, so you should. Yeah, we're not talking about the quarterback. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, we're talking about this person. That's probably the most, yeah. A great portrait. He's um, speaking next week. Yes, he is speaking with Tanahasi and I. Anyway, um, there's there's David Carr, the not the one who's not Judd Apatow or <laughs> um, the person who created Girls. Um, uh, so um, it, it's interesting to me that you worked with <laughs> President Bush, um, and then since the end of the Bush administration, certainly ha your your public work has been very focused on. Um, forging bipartisan yep. coalitions, yep. and yep. and I think there are a lot of people who see that administration as a very partisan yep. time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great question. Uh, here's what's interesting about that period and the the, the overall frame of not just those eight years, but the preceding time. And the, and, the, and the context, which, which a lot of people either weren't around or don't remember. But uh, f first of all, as I, as I mentioned in, in Texas when George W. Bush was governor, he worked very closely with the, this, this, this legend that I mentioned, his lieutenant governor, who was kind of a Sam Rayburn, Lyndon Johnson type of guy, been around forever, and he was his mentor to George Bush. And they worked so well together. And, and a Democrat. And, and oh, yeah, huge Democrat. And, 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 and Texas lieutenant governor and governor are not elected together. No, they're not. And in fact, the lieutenant governor arguably has more power than the governor. Okay. And, but as I mentioned, he felt so strongly about Bush that he endorsed Bush over his godson. That's how strongly he felt. So very bipartisan. And that's, that's part of what attracted me to, to him, as I mentioned on these other issues. But uh, I mean, he was talking about it being a different kind of Republican, uh, compassionate conservative agenda, all these things uh, which, which were attractive to me. But also, one of the, one of the things that you may remember, because you were around, is, and, and I, I, I think it'd be an interesting exercise to take some, some of his speeches from 1999, take some of Obama's speeches from 2007, mix them up, and I bet you you couldn't tell the difference. Right. Because they both were talking about changing the culture of Washington, D.C., 
working in a bipartisan fashion. So, but, but is that is that just the same way that if you took any politician, some speech from any period, and and no, no, I don't think so. I, no, I think they very uniquely were focused on that particular message about changing the tone of Washington, working in a bipartisan fashion. I mean, that's not what Romney ran on, and that's not what McCain ran on, and that's you know, I mean, they, they right. really, I mean, the the language itself was very particular. Uh, uh, on that it, issue. It was the Washington is broken language that certainly they're not the only two politicians who've adopted that. No, but, 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 but I mean the characteristics and the language and the tone was just, it was just, I mean it really, uh, as I think back on it, were, I, was, were, I was, when I saw Obama's speeches, I was like, God, that, you know, I went back and looked at some Bush's early right. speeches and I was like, Jesus, they're saying a lot of the same thing. Right. And for, 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 Certainly, in both cases, they hit the wall in Washington and met the practical realities of Washington. And for reasons that are similar and different, I mean, I think there are just the realities that they both confronted about just the entrenched nature of the special interests in Washington uh, that we could talk about for hours and how it got to be that way and how it's different now than it used to be, which is which is an interesting subject. But um, but then also Bush had the recount which poisoned the well for him right from the get-go. I mean, Democrats didn't, you know, a lot of Democrats and important Democrats on the Hill didn't see him as a legitimate president. Right. And that just, that, that got things off to a very bad start. Not, not that, you know, arguably he wasn't complicit in his own way over time, but uh, you remember even despite that, in the first couple of years with Ted Kennedy, he worked in a very bipartisan fashion, got no child left behind, done a number of other things. And same thing happened with Obama in a different way with the sort of the birthers on the Republican side also finding a rationale for thinking that he wasn't a legitimate president. So it just creates this huge hyper-partisan poison as well that I think has affected both of their presidencies. And that, I mean, that's also just part of the evolution of politics in Washington and the, and the media. And, you know, this is kind of on the topic that we're talking about, which it's just harder and harder uh, uh, and, and more challenging. I mean, I, I think for, for every, every four years, uh, it's an impossible job, in my opinion, and it's an amazing uh, challenge for anybody. I, I, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but, but it struck me that the parallel there between Democrats who were viewing Bush as not legitimate because of the recount and Republicans who were viewing <laughs> Obama as not legitimate because they don't believe he was born in the United States, one of those is a more reality-based <laughs> argument. Sure. Yeah. No, no. I, I concede that completely. I'm just saying that people out there who were inclined to be that way anyway right, found right. their own rationale and reasons, and they went to those kind of bases to right. say, well, here's why. And and then and that and and that reality affected the whole environment. I think. Right. Right. And Tanahasi. So in 2008, by that point, you had been at the Atlantic for a little while. Is that right? I came in on into. I was covering two. So yes, I guess I I'm, I came in 08. I did. I okay. Came in 08. Yeah. Um, and you started then writing more about national politics. Right. Was that because of something unique about that race? Was it about Obama's entry into that race, or was it just where you were in your the evolution of your career? It was I had gotten laid off from Time Magazine. That was probably the most important factor. <laughs> That's a very important factor. Um, I had gotten laid off, and this thing called blogging had happened. And I had, at that point, been in journalism for 12 years. and. Before blogging, and I think this is like a sea change. This is a really, really big sea change. <clears throat> no matter how excited you were, I just went on this whole thing about enthusiasm, and you know that's great. But no matter how excited you were, you really before you know the rise of blogs, you really had to convince somebody else uh, in order to you know make make your voice heard. You mean convince someone else? Get, to, convince someone to, to let publish you, it. To, right. To let publish you it. Use their pages. As right. A exactly. 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 And then this thing came up where there was suddenly <laughs> no border anymore. <laughs> you know, you could just sort of throw it out in the world, and if the world liked it, that was great. And if they didn't, you you know, you found that out too. Uh, so in 2008, uh, I, I finished. Uh, I'd begun uh, freelancing for the, for, uh, for the, for the magazine. Uh, I had finished my first book. For the Atlantic. Book, for the Atlantic, right. yes. Um, I had finished my first book, and I had nothing to do. Uh, my unemployment checks had run out. And um, I just started blogging, just you know, out, out of nowhere. You know, I was still you know, doinking around and, and freelancing in various places. And um, it did strike me that there was somebody who was running for president who might win who looked a little different than everybody else. 
that was on my mind. Right. And I thought as a journalist, I should document that, you know? And it just, you know, it, I, I got pretty lucky. I got to go out, you know, to Denver for the convention um, and ended up in a, you know, a, a few key places. It was, it was fascinating. It was, it was such an education. It really, really was. And, and so when you, uh, when you started covering national politics. Oh, 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 something else, too. The other thing that struck me was at that point, like, there was coverage of Obama, and it really became clear. And, you know, we don't have to spend too much time talking about this, but this is an important point from when I realized that, you know, maybe I should do some of this. It was very clear that the vast majority of people covering the Obama campaign had no understanding of black America at all. Um, of its history, of its politics, of anything, of absolutely anything. And I thought that maybe I could, <laughs> you know, I'm not saying I have any sort of total knowledge, <laughs> but it was clear to me that I had a little bit of an advantage. And is, is that advantage. because there were no black reporters on the campaign trail? No, or? there were, there were, there were. I actually think, I think part of it is, is the motive of, of what journalism is. Um, journalism as a form right now, uh, one of my big beefs is totally ahistorical. Um, right. You know, uh, and, and I, I think that's a huge, I mean, you can, just to give a specific example, uh, Barack, by the time Barack Obama ran in 08, um, black America was pretty used to African Americans running for president. It had seen Shirley Chisholm, it had seen Jesse Jackson twice, it had seen Al Sharpton, I think at that point twice, uh, it had seen Alan Keyes. It, it was very used to African Americans running and I, I don't think uh, people quite <coughs> got that you know so if you if you you know go back to 08 when you it, say people didn't quite get that I don't me. think media got that so right. there was like surprise for instance that Hillary Clinton was beating him among African-American voters which made total sense to me uh, because African-Americans you know they got the right to vote through a you know a hard fight they treasure that right to vote they want to back a winner Right. And very practical and very yeah. tactical about it. There's nothing surprising about it at all. And if you understood the history of African Americans, you wouldn't be shocked by you know the support for Hillary Clinton at all. And so when I, that was like one of the earliest things that you know really struck me that folks don't quite understand what's going on here. And that was a big, big prom thing for and me to go did, ahead and. Go did you have any sense? Because I know when I started covering the 2000 campaign, <coughs> I had never covered national politics before, and I, I, I felt almost right away like there I was had just come into some tribal thing mm -hmm. that I, no one had told me <laughs> what the vocabulary was and what the rules were. Right. And um, in some ways, I think my understanding of politics and of that campaign was helped by the fact that I wasn't of that world. Right. Did you have a similar experience? Yeah, I did. Well, I, when I remember when, when I went out to Denver and at the time I was writing about Michelle Obama and the, uh, the thing that they do where like, um, who, the, they, who's they? I'm sorry, the media, <laughs> of which I am a part of. <laughs> the thing we do, um, I, I would never do that again, though. Um, where, uh, you know, you, you pick up a magazine or a newspaper and they profile some somebody, and uh, you'll always see this kind of scene that really, I guess it's supposed to convey humanness that doesn't really make any sense. Like, Michelle Obama was wearing this, and she walked past this. And, and I got to see that they actually set that up. Right. You know, that like Michelle Obama's handlers tell you, you can be here at this point in time. You don't get to ask her any questions, but she's going to walk past. And that'll give you your color for your story. <laughs> and I totally, you know, regardless of whether that conveys any truth of anything. In fact, I was out. I was out there with David Carr. David Carr was there at the DNC. I'm sorry he keeps coming up. This is hard. You guys should come next week. Um, I was out there, and I said, because I did. I did. And David had been with you in 2000 yeah, and had yeah. experience with this. And I said, I have gotten limited exposure to this woman. They have put me in all of these places where I don't know. Like, this means nothing. You know, I've seen these scenes appear in other reporters' you know, pieces, but they, it, it has no meaning at all for any reader. It's not interesting at all. And he told me, you have to figure out what it means. You have to put your own thing on it. You just have to do it. Meaning and, you have to figure out what it means to put your own thing on it because you're not going to get anything else. Yeah, you're so. not going to get it from her. I mean, you can go report elsewhere. You can go talk to other people. But you're not. That's, that's, that's what they're going to give you. And you're going to have to bring something to bear to it. Um, which was sort of just like, I, I didn't realize how planned and how choreographed. It's very depressing. 
I really, really didn't realize how planned and choreographed the coverage of, 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 of presidential candidates is. And, and Mark, so is that something that, talking about um, whether political reporting is functions as news or entertainment, is that something that has evolved or changed dramatically over the last decade or so? I mean, even in 2000, um, I, where I spent a lot of time with the McCain campaign, that campaign was obviously notoriously um, shoot from the hip and gave all kinds of access. And so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not to cut you off, but did they do any of that? You have to be here, you know, look at this at this specific with time. With the McCain campaign in 2000, he had, I mean, it was almost pathological. He had reporters with him all the time. Um, you know, he had reporters on his bus all the time. And was the journalism better? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think it yeah, was. Yeah, it was different. Certainly of the McCain campaign. And I think, in fact, and this was something I was going to ask you, that it forced Bush to respond differently to the media. Because at, when McCain started getting more traction, all of a sudden, when I was with Bush, he would go from being sort of sequestered in the front of his press plane to coming back much more. There were all sorts of, um, uh, you know, uh, Karen Hughes became much more willing to have people interact with um, uh, Bush on a less scripted yeah. stage. Yeah. Well, here's the dynamic tension. <clears throat> You write about McCain, and that was, that was, you know, McCain got a, a ton of media love uh, in 2000 for being kind of the, the wide open, candid, unscripted guy. And that, that kind of, that got him, a, a, you know, a, a lot of, uh, that got him up the runway a good ways. And, and certainly uh, in the Bush campaign, the joke was that his base constituency was, was the, the media. media. Right, right. Um, but then, so, but that all evolved, and then uh, over the course of time, and this has to do a lot with, I think, the evolution of, of the media and how it works differently now. You you have the jor, you know, the macaca, uh, the Senate moment with you know just sort of the full body coverage, and so candidates and campaigns became more concerned about that kind of access because they were just afraid that there was going to be a moment because it's all being captured all the time. And unlike old so days or in the Kennedy days where something like that would happen, they'd say, you know, they just all kind of agree that we keep that, you know. But, but that's the rules now. There are no rules. I mean, in terms of kind of letting, you know, something unscripted happen and not report it, that's not going to happen anymore. So, in fact, just the opposite and where we see sort of secret recordings. Right. Uh, of people trying to get every moment, even those that aren't supposed to be public. So that changes the behavior. And, and it changed McCain's behavior in 2008, because uh, he kind of started off that way, but then the campaign jumped in and just said, you know, because he would go off message, as they call it, and kind of you know, ruin the storylines they were trying to create. So, they, so what happened, the response has been that the campaigns have become more scripted as a response to the media. But ironically, at the same time that all that's happening, voters have become much more skeptical about the information that they get from campaigns because they, write, they rightly perceive it as being scripted. And, and so they find it not believable, not credible. And so actually, uh, I, 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 I have a presentation that I do that I've been doing for 15 or 20 years called the architecture of a political message. And, and I keep adapting and evolving. And the most recent chapter that I dropped into it was the importance of authenticity in today's media because because if I mean adver political advertising is almost completely meaningless because people just assume they're being lied to and I've got to, I'd like to talk about that at some point before yeah, we're yeah. done because I got a particular example about that that I'd like to talk about which has to do with truth in campaigns today and what what's happened to the the truth but uh, so the 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 moment that I used to describe to reflect the, the value of authenticity was Hillary Clinton in the 2008 campaign. You remember when Barack Obama won Iowa, shocked the world. Suddenly he's up 20 points in New Hampshire. His pollster tells him it's in the bag. No need. To, we don't even need to poll for the rest of the week. It's done. And then Hillary Clinton, 24 hours before that uh, election, 
had this completely spontaneous moment on the campaign trail. She's exhausted, tired. Somebody throws her kind of a softball question about, you know, well, how, how are you doing? And, and she kind of, she has this very vulnerable moment. She and chokes up. She chokes up, kind of tears up. And I remember initially reports like, oh, she's crying, she's done. <laughs> then you see the video and you go, wow, that's a really human moment. You know, I've never seen this side of this person. Well, and that, and was, that was an interesting moment because it showed it, on, on one level, the disconnect that there was between the way the public was perceiving events and the way the, camp, the, way the, the political press was perceiving events. Because the initial yeah. media reaction to that was, if Obama was going to win by 20 points before, now he's going to win by 40 exactly points. Exactly right, yeah. And he lost. Yeah, 24 hours later. Right. And that's, that's how dramatically that moment of authenticity, because people just saw kind of behind the curtain. They said, oh, this is the real person. And, and, uh, and, and that's how powerful that can be. If, if, so talking about uh, the, the uh, campaigns have gotten more scripted, which I think everyone would agree is true. But in terms of the information that the public gets, you know, in, in, in 1960, you had Ben Bradley went on to be editor of the Washington Post at the time, uh, was writing for Newsweek, going to uh, porn movies with Kennedy and obviously not reporting on that. Um, uh, it's hard to imagine that happening today, certainly. Um, uh, so the interactions that the media had with candidates were less scripted, but was the presentation that the public got any less scripted? Hmm. Uh, well, like I said, the rules were different. I mean, they were, they were different then, and, and so the presentation wasn't authentic. I mean, it really wasn't. Right. But, but it's a completely different environment that we live in now. Right, right. So um, in the 2008 campaign, I know that you, that, that was a difficult sort of moment for you in terms of where you were going to line up. Well, I just had an unusual situation where I, <clears throat> I, I, uh, I, I had a relationship with McCain and the McCain people that goes back that went back to, I was like one of the only people in the Bush campaign that were actually communicating with the McCain people. Because right. I just had relationships going back and I love McCain's campaign finance stuff and always just respected him and his, his sacrifice. Because there's, there's not a lot of love lost there in There wasn't, general, just because of the general 2000 campaign, but, but I maintained a relationship there. And then later, uh, we got together and he's, you know, and I said if I can, you know, ever come down and cut your lawn in Sedona or anything. I'm right. glad, happy to do it's it. It's a nice lawn. Yeah. Uh, and he said, and so then the lady said, would you come help me in the campaign? And I, and I really didn't, I was really kind of burned out. And, but I said, I'll kind of help put the team together. And at what point was this? Was this, this was really early on, really early on. And then. So during the primaries? Yeah, early in the primaries. I mean, it was just right when it first started. And I, I initially just pledged to kind of put the team together and drop in on a few conference calls. Then, as you probably you will recall, the campaign melted down, everybody quit. And I had been just a volunteer to kind of help out. And I, so I, I stayed on and with that him. That was late in 2007? That was December. kind of middle 2007, like right. spring 2007. It all melted down. and. Um, and so I, I, I agreed to stay on. Then I went full time, but he's still in a, in, in a voluntary status just because he couldn't afford to pay anybody. And I, I just kind of, my, my point at that time was I just wanted to kind of help him get his honor back. Right. Uh, and then things happened. But what happened is at the beginning of the campaign, I had met Barack Obama and I liked him. And, and I disagreed with him politically on, on a lot of things, but I liked him and I also, uh, I liked th what the idea of his candidacy could be, and I thought it would be good for the country. And I didn't want to be the guy, the point man, in a Republican campaign doing what generally happens in presidential campaigns. I didn't want to be the, the trigger man, and, and, and I also didn't think it would be good for the campaign. And I just wouldn't be comfortable. So I wrote a, a memo to the campaign the day I started, which was, again, early in 2007. I just said, I'm honored to... To, to work for you and to help you try and win the primary, but in the, you know, and, and at this time nobody thought Barack Obama was going to win. But I said if Barack Obama wins the primary and you win the primary, then I'd like I'd feel more comfortable stepping away at that point and uh, uh, and just going to the sidelines. And, and then it happened, and I went to McCain, and he said, "Oh yeah, right, I forgot about that." And uh, <laughs> But he, was, he said, listen. He said. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and how, who did you end up voting for in 2008? For McCain. I, and I supported him and, and voted for him. Uh, but uh, and it was really hard to walk away at that point because I 
put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into that campaign, and it was this great resurrection and comeback. And uh, but McCain, you know, he, he said it'd be very un-McCain-like not to honor your word, and I appreciate all you've done, and God bless you. Uh, and then, and then later, I was, you know, given the way things worked out, I was happy that I did walk away because a lot of things happened that I thought would happen. And I'm glad I wasn't part of it. Right. And, uh, anyway, so that's that's kind of that. The and unusual arc. ta so in, in 2008, when, when you all of a sudden are covering this campaign, um, and, and I didn't know you at the time, but I remember uh, um, even people talking about you as if your identity covering that campaign was not a journalist, it was a black journalist. Is that something that you felt at the time, and did you feel like you were supposed to write about the campaign in a certain way because of that? No, I am a black journalist, so it's okay. <laughs> Wait, I mean, you know, <laughs> right, yes. And, and I'm a brown-haired journalist, right, but, yes. um, <laughs> but, but right. you, you understand the implication of what I'm saying. It was almost as if there was, there was, um, there seemed to be, in at least some of the things I was reading, this idea that it would be impossible for um, someone to write about this historic campaign in a way that was equally impartial uh, to... Yeah, uh, you know what? I'm totally fine with that. I was not impartial. I was very excited about the possibility of an African-American president, and I said it, and I, 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 you know, I come out of opinion media. You know, City right. People was opinionated. I've always laid my biases out front. I've never... And those biases include being an African-American. Um, my argument is that more more people should leave their biases out front. I agree. <laughs> you know, so no, I had I had no problem with that. I mean, I I strongly believe that the proof is you know in the pudding. You come read what I write, and you know you feel how you feel about that. Like I always thought that if I were good, then that would that would ultimately be what would matter. And so, and then during that campaign, when you were seeing the things and experiencing the things that were then written about in the national media, mm -hmm. um, did your perspective on the value or place of political reporting change at all? Or did it change how now when you read something in the newspaper um, uh, about politics, do you interpret it differently? You know, I don't have a TV, and I threw my TV out in 07 or 08. And Literally? It, yeah, literally, like, not right. threw it out the window, but, right. but took it down to the garbage. I didn't right. throw it out the window. I didn't want to hit anybody. Um, the defenestration of Chris Matthews. Right. Right. <laughs> 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 um, but it was Chris Matthews. Like, I, would, I would, like, cut on Chris Matthews. And there's nothing personal against him. It could have been anybody, right? And I would cut on the TV, and it was very clear that nothing was actually happening. <laughs> like nothing was actually happening. Like on a day to day basis, nothing, like literally nothing. I mean, and but so it was so covered in such a way as though, you know, every little thing, but it didn't. And like it was amazing Were to you me already on the campaign at that point? Were you already No, no, I was like writing from home. And I think this, so it would have been 07, so I actually think it was like late 07. So I don't think I even started blogging yet. I think I threw out my TV before. I really do. I really do. Usually the 07 or 08. Maybe I've done that. You've missed all of Mad Men and. <laughs> no, no, see, well, you know, another development has happened since then. Right. You yeah. know? But, but, you know, at, at, at that point, um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say was I really began at that point questioning, like, um, what, what, what is actually being communicated? And it wasn't even just, I'm using Chris Matthews as an example, but, you know, it could have been, you know, the daily newspapers too, like you, because there has to be a story every day. But how much information is actually being conveyed. You know, so it was very clear to me we have this conflict that we have a lot of space and you can mm -hmm. look at that as TV time. You can look at that as, you know, inches in a newspaper. You can look at that as your feature well. But often nothing is actually, I mean, these campaigns go on forever yeah. and nothing substantive will happen. And then something big will happen. I guess the fear is that you don't want to miss that. You don't want to not be there for that moment. So yeah, that's I mean that's an interesting part of the dynamic that's that's absolutely true. Is you know the the journalists have space to fill and they can't stand static. Right. Right. They, they don't want a static storyline, right. so they're they're pushing to create a storyline. <laughs> and they're, they're well, is it is it journalists who can't stand a static storyline? I think or it's is it, uh, or, or is it the pub? I mean, is it you know the people who are watching TV? I mean, if you had well, it's clearly a demand for it, right? right? Exactly. I mean, it, it clearly is a demand. I mean, is it is it entirely fair to say, well, yes, this is journalists who are doing this? If you had if Chris if Chris Matthews' TV show was him for an hour every night saying things are basically the 
same as they were yesterday, <laughs> I'm guessing that he, he, he would be doing even worse than he is in the ratings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no question about that. Yeah. So uh, right now, we're living in an era in which we have access to more information than we ever have had in the past, um, uh, and access to more different types of information than we ever had, have had in the past. When it comes to politics, do you feel like we are being well informed as a public? Well, let me take this opportunity to jump into just a, an yeah. example of, of what you're talking about. Um, the, so, I mean, the question is what kind of information do we get from the body politic and is it accurate, is it true, and wh where's the sort of evolution of that dynamic? And I, I, rem I was the, the ad guy for campaigns. You know, I did, that's mostly what I've done over the last 30 years or so. And, um, but, and, and I remember when we were, and I, I remember producing ads, and, and we would be creative, I'll say creative, uh, but we would never actually, you know, say something that was wrong. I mean, we might kind of color, you know, the way that we wanted it. So you, mean, the, you would never lie directly. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and then what happened is that, but that you know, but we we could get very creative, uh, and then then there was when a. When you say get very creative, are you talking about like well, different just, camera shots, or are you talking no, about creative no, with the truth? No, can kind of embellish what you've right. done, and uh, and and that sort of thing. But um, but then as a corrective response to our our uh, expanding creativity, the news industry, business, and I, I remember specifically the first woman who did it in Texas, a news manager, did, you know, came up with a truth test. Mm -hmm. They said, well, we're going to start, you know, we're not going to just let these things go out unfiltered. We're going we're to start reporting on it and having, uh, you know, truth tests. And, and that had a huge impact on us and what we what, did. What year was that? Uh, uh, this would be late 80s. Okay. Um, Early 90s, right? And so, suddenly, and very helpfully, when we were producing ads for our campaigns, we were thinking in the back of our mind, "Oh, this is going to get truth tested," and uh, so we've got to be very careful about what we say and how we characterize things, because when it happened to the other side, when somebody else's campaign would get a truth test and the truth test would say, oh, they bent the truth or something, we'd jump on that, our campaign would, right? And we'd, we'd make an ad about that, that they distorted the truth. And that would have a you know, significant impact because people were saying, you know, this campaign's not telling you the truth. Wait, so that, that was 20 years ago. So do you think that political ads have become more t closely tied to reality in that time? More, he, he asked skeptically. More closely tied to reality then? Yeah, no, now. I mean, so you, you, the, the implication of what you were saying was that you became even more cautious about embellishing because you we knew We did that then. You were, we did then. So a corollary to that would be that today ads are more accurate because people are worried about getting truth tested. No. That, that you're, the second half of what I was going to say is that over that period of time, what happened is that people became sort of inured to that notion of the, the truth test right. and, and, and reached its absolute distortion in this last campaign. And I just want to play two ads, and then, I, and then I, I'll just play them without any editorial comment. You'll remember these. Uh, and then I, want to, then I want to comment on them. Okay, here's, here's one of them. Welfare recipients were required to work. This bipartisan reform successfully reduced welfare rolls. On July 12th, reduced welfare rolls. On July 12th, President Obama quietly ended the work requirement, gutting welfare reform. One of the most respected newspapers in America called it nuts, saying, if you want to get more people to work, you don't loosen the requirements, you tighten them. Mitt Romney's plan for a stronger middle class will put work back in welfare. I'm Mitt Romney, and I approve this message. Okay, so that's one ad. Now here's the second ad, which was an Obama ad. <coughs> Hopefully. Hope you ain't depending on that MIT internet. <laughs> <laughs> Trouble. 
here. You might need to hear. <laughs> this is how inaccurate this sound was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll just describe it. This, this was the ad that uh, Obama ran. Uh, you, you can describe it, and I'll try and get it up. Well, here. <clears throat> well, let, let me, okay, well, look, while you're trying to get that up, let me, let me start with the Romney ad, okay? Um, so th that, that Romney ad came out and was, was demonstrably false. I mean, there just was, there was nothing about it that was true. And... Uh, and, 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 and when confronted with the truth, when there are organizations as well as, uh, as, well as publications now that, that specialize in, in which, which it's the it? second one, is that one? Yeah. Okay. That specialize in reporting and, and studying political communications and being the kind of gatekeepers for the truth. Every one of them said completely false, completely false. And, the, and rather than, than cor make a corrective uh, 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 a turn, or uh, uh, rather than edit the spot, or take it down, or respond that, or even even try to respond that it was in some way uh, accurate. The the Romney campaign was. Uh, uh, let me just read this to you. Uh, I don't think Mitt Romney okay. understands what he's done to people's lives by closing the plant. I don't think he realizes that, that people's lives completely change. When Mitt Romney and Bain closed the plant, I lost my health care. And my family lost their health care. And uh, uh, a short time after that, my wife became ill. I don't know how long she was sick. Uh, and I think maybe she didn't say anything because she knew that we, we couldn't afford the insurance. And, and then one day she, she uh, became ill, and then I took her up to the Jackson County Hospital and, and, and admitted her for pneumonia, and that's when they found the cancer. And by then it was stage four. It was, it was, there was nothing they could do for her. And she passed away in 22 days. I do not think Mitt Romney realizes what he's done to anyone. And I, furthermore, I do not think Mitt Romney is concerned. Priorities USA Action is responsible for the content of this advertising. Okay, so let me just read you a, a couple quick things here. So on the Romney ad, here was a here was a, 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 a dispatch. Presumptive Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney's campaign has drawn fire for misleading ads against President Barack Obama on welfare. But the Romney campaign said Tuesday it's not concerned with being labeled false by independent fact checkers. Quote, fact checkers come to this with their own set of thoughts and beliefs, and we're not going to let our campaign be dictated by fact checkers. Uh, so, so you had a response from the campaign saying, we don't really care about the truth. I mean, that's fundamentally what they're saying. We don't care about fact checkers. And kept running the ad. Now, uh, so now here's a response on, on the, uh, the Obama ad. Uh, let's see, let me, let me um, were you gonna say something? Well, I was just, I, I, and certainly the last thing I wanna do is, is have this. I don't think Mitt Romney understands what he's done to people's lives by closing the door. I don't, I don't think he realizes that, that people's lives completely change. No, no. Mitt Romney and Bain closed the plant. <laughs> um, uh, um, I mean, that, 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 the, the language there is, is, is not dissimilar to the language in that famous New York Times Magazine article in 2002 or 2003 about um, when uh, uh, talking to one of Bush's advisors and his dismissal of the reality-based community and that that wasn't what the campaign and that wasn't what the administration's message was concerned with. Well, I have a lot of problems with the guy who wrote that book. Read that, right. Yeah. And so, uh, All right. you know. We don't need to. Uh, that, that can be another topic for another day. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I never heard anybody say that. And, you know, I know that there's a lot of things that were in that book yeah, yeah, that, right. that I didn't say that were ascribed to me. So, I don't know okay. where that came from. Uh, and, and I don't know anybody that believed that. So, um, so now the other ad says, 
This, the Obama ad, was filmed by the super PAC run by former White House aide Bill Burton and features a steel worker who used to work for a company that was taken over by Bain Capital, the investment firm founded by Romney. The worker lost his job and health insurance, and the ad insinuates a link between that and his wife's subsequent death from cancer. Independent fact checkers have noted, however, the cancer patient featured in the ad died six years after Bain bought the husband's company, that she had her own health insurance through her employer, and that Romney was not in charge of the investment firm when her husband was let go. Uh, and then it goes on to describe how the present campaign said, oh, well, that's a PAC, and we're not, you know, that's a separate entity, and we're not legally. So they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they, ref they refused, to, they just, their response was, well, you know, we had nothing to do with that. We didn't, we didn't coordinate, we legally can't coordinate. And then it was disclosed later that they actually had been on a conference call with this guy in an earlier ad that they've done. So they did know about this guy. So anyway, there was just, on both sides, there were just extreme examples uh, of, of taking it to the limit where, where, where any common sense sort of uh, legitimate outside agency said these are completely false, and yet they refused to even, not only not acknowledge that they were false and take them down, they just said, well, we're, we, we, don't, we don't care about that and just push right on through it. So, and were, the, were uh, those ads that had uh, significant ad buys or were those ads, because I know there was also a phenomenon in the most recent election of essentially making incendiary ads, not even airing them, just putting them online and then essentially using them as chum for, for reporters who would then, and they would get a lot more coverage and exposure than the ad ever would have. That's a, that's a whole nother development, which is, yeah, I mean, which is, th the reality is that, uh, again, this goes to the whole, the whole issue of ads and their effectiveness. Uh, th people don't generally believe ads, so a lot of what happens today is that the, the political campaigns are trying to get into the larger narrative of the, of the press coverage, because that is seen as more legitimate and credible for viewers who are looking for, you know, a more authentic messenger. And so right. you're right, what the campaigns now do is they'll create ads to try and get a story about the ad in the paper or the news coverage and really won't, we used to at least buy some time, you know, we, we'd do this to sort of get coverage too, but we thought we had to at least actually buy some time. But it's kind of the point today where they don't even buy the time, they just put out an ad. Right. And they and they get the coverage they that they're looking right. for, and so it's this little game that goes on. So before we open it up, um, Tom Hasse, I just I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, your fear of a black president piece, the the piece that's nominated for National Magazine Award. Um, uh, first, well, why don't you just tell us a little bit about about the piece? Uh, sure. Um, first, I just I, I'm sorry. I, I want to go back to this point if I can. Just yeah, for a second, yeah, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I. I I guess what seems to undergird this is this notion, um, and I think we kind of got at this when we were talking about <coughs> how I, the market, mm -hmm. uh, for you know believing that something is changed. Wait, I'm sorry. What do you mean, the market? The market for news. The, the, right. the, the idea that you know you have space to fill, and people are clearly buying that space, and people are clearly viewing that. I don't want to sound too cynical here, but um, this sort of you know division. Well, you see, you know, people running ads like, 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 you know, you just described, and I have, you know, no doubt that, you know, when people are running for president, they, they lie. I, I guess I'm skeptical that there is this. Um, I wonder how much people believe what they want to believe today. I guess that's what I'm saying. I'm wondering how much any of this actually ultimately matters. Um, to what extent, even, you know, with like what you're, you're saying about um, the media. When you say uh, you're skeptical about how much this ultimately matters. I, I, like how much, like, I, I think if you want to believe that Mitt Romney is that guy, you're going to believe Mitt Romney's that guy. If you want to believe, you know, Obama, you know, is going to do that, you're going to believe it. And I'm skeptical to the point, even in terms of the media being a, uh, a, 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 a more uh, credible message. I, I, I think that I think that's a great point. That. And that, that, I think we should focus on that for just a second because I, I think you're, it's absolutely true that the, the country has become more partisan, has become more partisan, and in part has become more partisan because, uh, I mean, Washington is more partisan in part because the country has become more partisan. The country has become more partisan because people, one of the reasons is people become more mobile and they can move to communities of like-minded people and then they kind of self 
aggregate and, right. and sort of you know self-approve and you know it becomes a, a silo of information and, and beliefs and cascade where yeah and you know then you then you have the evolution of the media which which becomes increasingly siloed too and so I, th I think you're right I think that there's a huge shift in just the sense that there's just a bunch of people out there going to believe what they want to believe, and they're going to look for information. That, so they're going to see that commercial and say, "Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's what, that kind of goes to my my confirmation bias anyway." And I'm looking for information that'll feed what I want to believe. So I think that's, I think you're right about that. But so is that? Uh, are, are we talking then about how the public, as news consumers, can essentially create an information cocoon where they're only subjected to, exposed to um, uh, ideas, news stories, opinions, whatever, that already reinforce their world view. Well, which I, think, I, I think like there's an assumption among all of us who, who are journalists that, <laughs> God, this is going to sound really cynical. Um, and it, particularly, I, I think there's this assumption that if I provide you with accurate information, um, you will then you know, uh, make an informed decision. And I just wonder. Do you think journalists believe that? I think so. I mean, how? I mean, then what's the value of information if you know if, if, if right. that's not true? And I, like, we live in a time where there's more information, you know, available to certainly to Americans, maybe to the human population than ever in, in, in our history. And I wonder how much it matters, you know? Like, well, so I, let me let me push like how much do back we on that a little bit. I mean, I completely I. I I very much agree with the idea that um, with, with the implications of being able to form these information cocoons, both in terms of what we take <laughs> in and also in terms of where we live and who we see and who we interact with. But there were a couple of moments in the 2012 campaign, the 47% comment probably being right. the, the prime one of them, where that actually did seem to affect the way that the public at large was both viewed the candidate and viewed right. the race. Right. Well, that's a, a, a big unfiltered moment, right? Like, that's not, I mean, maybe, they, I guess they, they might have cut that into ads. I'm sure they did. Certainly, Obama in the second debate made it oh, part yeah. of his appeal. But <laughs> that's no, no. the kind of rare, unfiltered, just, you know, an elongated, you know, rift that you really, really are not, you know, uh, 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 going to see. You know, how, how often, how often are you going to see a 47% tape? How often are you going to see something like that, you know, where it can't really be disputed? Um, I don't know. I mean, Mark, you were, you were talking about how uh, the ways in When was which, the last time something like that happened? I think I mean, Obama's uh, cling to guns and religion comment. Right, but that's like a line. I mean, this was like, I mean, uh, and it's video. You know, I mean, this was, right. wasn't that kind of anomalous? Mark? <laughs> yeah, uh, the Macaca. Macaca is probably, right. yeah, and he lost. Right. And he lost, right. Yeah. I mean, do you think that um, uh, the media is essentially kidding themselves if they are laboring under the, um, under the notion that information is going to affect the way someone views a candidate or an issue or the world? Oh, yes, I'm cynical. It's more nihilistic, I think, than cynical. <laughs> I prefer, thank you. I prefer that. I prefer that. I mean, and, and I should clarify, I don't mean no effect. I guess I should. Right. I don't mean no effect. But I mean, I, I think especially coming on in a time of blogs and watching, you know, um, go on. Sorry, Mark. Go well, I, I think that's all true. And I think it's a matter of degrees. And it's, and it's changing and it's shifting. And I think there are journalists who still believe and, and will continue to believe. And there's some merit, uh, there's some degree of it, which is true, which is that they, they're trying to pursue what they think is an objective fact and truth that they're trying to communicate that they hope that will be consumed and considered in the debate. But, uh, but, but I'll whether or not journalists believe that, I mean, do you think that that's, do you, is, is that a fantasy? No, I, I, no, I don't. I, I, I still think that there, well, I think that there is, and perhaps, my hope is, my, my, my optimistic side is that, that in this revolution that we're in the middle of, of journalism, uh, where the pendulum has swung, that there'll be a point at which the voters and the public will, will realize that, that they are not getting the truth, haven't been getting the truth, and there'll be a greater premium placed on communicators that deliver what is, you know, that, that whatever the consensus body is, that, that it is actually true because 
there are, have, because they've been through a period of time where the consequences for not having gotten the truth have become so great that it evolves. So you think like this will shake out and then there'll be what, like trusted yeah. brands for instance? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's what I think. Uh, that would uh, that would surprise. I mean, it seems like that's you know returning to a, a, a pre-internet it, it, model yeah, it is where kind of, you yeah. had network news and a couple of big national newspapers that could sort of set a base national conversation. It's hard for me to see a scenario in which we return to that. Well, it'll be different, but I think in some ways it'll be like that. I think I think there will be trusted brands and trusted <laughs> aggregators, and you know where people. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I think it's going to evolve. Uh, okay. Um, uh, well, why don't we open it up? I've already taken up more of my time. Well, why do you? If, if you can, because we're recording. If you can go to one of the two microphones um, to ask the to ask the questions. And and just introduce yourself. Uh, I, my name is Greg PC. I actually I am the photographer here. I used to work for Hill and Nolan. Uh, why is it assumed that? There was a golden age of objectivity in political reporting. I mean, if you look at the 19th not, century, there was poli- it, it was highly politicized, and so it seems that the practice of journalism in terms of politics had a brief period of objectivity when it was controlled by commercial interests, and when those went away, you end up then with partisanship. I, I, I'm not, um, I, from my perspective, I'm not trying to imply that I think there was a golden age. I think that when there were a small number of news outlets that set the national conversation, <laughs> then you had a baseline that regardless of where you fell on the political spectrum, people were starting from. Whereas now, you know, what, what Mark was talking about in terms of the birthers or in terms of um, you know, 9-11 conspiracy theorists, uh, you don't have that baseline. And so when you have people disagree, they're not disagreeing about an issue where they agree even that the issue is what it is. Um, uh, they think that they're talking about totally different realities. So, but I'm not saying that there was some <laughs> golden age for objective reporting. Um, just that the implications of having a sort of national, um, these national standard setters created a different well, atmosphere. Was there one before? Was there one? Look, in the 1890, was there a national standard setter? Uh, no, certainly not in the 1890s. No, I mean, I think in the middle, the, 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 so the, the mid century. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, so sure. Before and after there wasn't. So we had this little window of national yeah. tastemakers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, in the 1890s, I think it doesn't make sense to talk about, I mean, this is a whole other discussion, but um, it doesn't make sense to talk about national tastemakers in a period in which, uh, you know, to get from one part of the country to the other took weeks. And what do you so, think other, in other countries you see very <laughs> Sure, yes. The, the, even the idea that the media should be objective is a very uniquely American idea. It's not the, the UK and, and most of Europe and most of the world does not share that view, certainly. So in human history, in one country, for a small slice of time, we have this idea. Right, <laughs> okay. yes. I think we're all OK with that. We are. <laughs> Um, Rodrigo Davis, uh, Comparative Media Studies in the Centre for Civic Media. I think you just said the, there's not a conception in the UK that the media should be objective. As a British person, I completely disagree with that. But um, I <laughs> will ask so a different you're, you're, question. You would disagree that, so you think the newspapers in the UK hmm? present themselves as nonpartisan? All right, if you're just talking about newspapers, but I mean, I was including broadcast media in that, and obviously we, you know, we all know the elephant in the room, the BBC. Right. The BBC is a debtors. slightly different situation because it's state-funded, or it's well, state-subsidized. Subsidized, <laughs> yeah. The majority of its funding doesn't come from the state anymore. It comes from BBC Worldwide, the private arm, which but is it, like it, selling planet Earth. And I, I'm, I'm even, even though you obviously have a position of expertise because I, the amount of time spent in the UK, I can count on uh, probably all my hands and feet, all my fingers and toes, um, I think it's unquestionable that, that the dominant method of um, the dominant paradigm for news organizations, primarily newspapers in the UK, is to associate themselves with a political party or a partisan agenda. That doesn't mean that they then say, and we can't report on the truth, but they're very upfront about the fact that they're reporting on those stories through the lens of um, a greater editorial vision. I, I would actually say it's, it's more complicated by class 
than partisanship. Sure. Yeah. Because I think that backing point. of parties is extremely tactical. You know, so the son being the voice of the white van man, right. you know, uh, that's, uh, backs absolutely. Labour at some point, backs the Tories when they seem to be in the ascendancy with, with that constituency. Right. right. Anyway, sorry, right. I didn't mean to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a very different question, um, which is a colleague and I um, are looking into the impact of internet memes. Um, on elections, specifically the last presidential election. So your binders full of women, horses and bayonets, this kind of stuff that spreads online and that people remix and share. Um, and I'm just interested in hearing what you think it means to cover these memes in political journalism. Because we did see a surprising amount of like Big Bird popping up on the front page of major news websites. So is this just like covering any other agenda item? Um, or is it like a process story, like, you know, this troublesome <coughs> meme came up and this is how Romney handled it? Or are there any kind of other existing paradigms of participation in elections that, that these memes fit into? Uh, I find it to be, I, you know, I'll just speak for myself, but I found it more uh, to be uh, a way in which, here I am being cynical again, people who already agree with each other talk and have in-jokes. Um, but is your question how the, 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 how the media covers those? That's right. How does the media regard <laughs> them? I mean, this may be part of that. Yeah. Um, I don't know, because I don't know how it goes beyond that. I mean, uh, watching Twitter, uh, I primarily you know, saw remarks about binders full of women. And um, it's like, just like in jokes, you know, that people traded amongst each other. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't, I don't know that it goes, you know, beyond like whipping up the base. I don't know that it becomes much more than that. Uh -huh. um, to me, it's what, just what do you, what do you, how do you go beyond this is something people are saying? Like, how does it, like, what, what's the impact beyond? Maybe well, you could tell me. I mean, me. it's the changing the discourse argument, I guess. I mean, you, you, you seem pretty skeptical that it's possible to change the discourse. Through no, the no, no, no. I think, I think, it's, <laughs> but I just, I wonder, like, um, my, my question back to you would be, what, what is the impact then? Um, that it changes the discourse because campaigns see these messages that kids are making for partly for fun and they, they incorporate them. So, you know, after the Big Bird meme came out, you might have thought this was just throwaway, but the Obama campaign started referring to it and using it. Right. Um, right. And the same with the binders full of women. Maybe, uh, you know, it's, this was a great emblem of like, you know, what the public was saying about Romney, and it becomes like a weapon. But isn't it just an emblem, sorry. No, no, no. Isn't it just an emblem of what their supporters are already saying? Like, isn't it, you know, the base talking to, you know, the preferred candidate? Isn't, isn't that the real discourse? Well, I, I think there's the assumption, which may be wrong, that the kinds of people who create these memes aren't necessarily your party activists, although they do it as well. No, they're not, right. It's, not it's a lot of the right. kind of disinterested or, you know, allegedly apathetic <laughs> kind of youth <laughs> who aren't really voting or aren't participating. They're kind of bored with politics. That's where we would disagree. Okay, sorry, yeah, I shouldn't, I actually don't mean that. I mean, it's not that they're disengaged or apathetic. Mm -hmm. It's that they're, um, they are tired of the conventional means of engaging. So this is their way of engaging. I, I mean, okay. one, one, one question I'd like to raise is that almost by definition, when you're talking about memes, is that something that someone created or did it become <laughs> a meme because you know, 30 seconds after Romney said binders full of women in the debate, there that there that was you know the number one trending topic on Twitter, and that that wasn't and someone some kid or adult or anyone who said I'm going to create a meme here. It just seized hold of the cultural imagination in a way that um, without those it. it probably would not have become that type of story without something like Twitter, because I, I don't think the press was going to treat it as the main story coming out of that debate until it became the number one trending topic on Twitter. But Mark, did you, you had a comment about that? Well, I, I would just say that it's, uh, uh, well, first of all, I would say that, you know, e even though the, the, the slice of the, you know, the, the, the Persuadable voters has become narrower and narrower, and uh, you know the, the elections are still very close uh, here, and that that something's affecting those unpersuaded people ultimately. Although a lot of the times I think unpersuaded uh, or persuadable voters are people who who don't end up voting. 
Uh, but but you know, you're fighting over a very limited pool, and so any of these things can affect it. And so you, you fight over every inch of turf. Um, I was just going to say that, that I think that in, 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 uh, that in many ways, what you're describing is just a broader sort of, of uh, sandbox of tools and toys that reflect what we used to do just with, with single channels. You know, we, we would try something like notebooks would have come up in a debate, and we would have gone out there and done a press release on it. Mm. You know, and tried to have our surrogates go out and talk about it. Now you just have in a post debate. You know, post debate yeah, spin, right. but you know, we didn't have Twitter to do it, and now that just amplifies it so quickly. But uh, and, and maybe gets to a different universe of people. But in many ways, it's just an extension, an electronic and modern extension of many of the things that we used to try and do, just in, not not as well. Yeah, that's that's something I'm really interested in. You know, I don't pretend that this type of spreadable, remixable discourse was invented with the internet. Yeah. So I'd, I'd love to talk to you more about some of those pre-internet examples. Well, I'm an expert on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Uh, Chris Peterson, Comparative Media Studies Center for Civic Media. Um, so the title for this talk was um, News or Entertainment? I'm very bad about sticking with. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also thought that that was maybe like a, a bad title. Okay. Um, in Did you in come the up sense. With the title, sir? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. That the distinction. Um, Maybe, and this puts it a little bit into what you were talking about with needing to fill airtime, um, that there's an industrial context here, right? Which is that people watch TV or read, you know, newspapers or magazines for t one of two reasons and sometimes both. You know, one is to fill their time in the day that's left behind, behind work and sleep. Um, and the other is to have something to talk about with their friends. And that's true whether it's um, news reports, the Weather Channel or Gilligan's Island. The, you think those are the only two reasons that people read newspapers? Fundamentally, yes. That, that, that it's part of it is to just fill the time in their day because they have to do something. And the other is talk about it. Now, what they're talking about with their friends, they may talk about for different reasons. And those things may be more or less um, connected to something that affects their everyday life in a very real sense. Well, let me just, so how many people here today read an article in a newspaper? Or a website. Or a website, sure. And, and how many of you talked about that article with someone else during the day? Yeah. So maybe half of those people. And how many of the people who read something during the day feel like they have a surplus of time in the day? <laughs> No one's going to cop to that, though. No, no but no, no one's so going to he, he will. Yeah. So, I mean, but well, I, I, don't mean, I don't mean necessarily. I mean, there's a cognitive surplus argument that Clay Shirky makes, right, about a surplus of time. But I, I mean, when you're filling your time in your day, I don't mean like you have a bunch of lax time lying around. You might be a knowledge professional where it's your job to know things, but it's still how, you know, you're filling your time. But, but the point that I, I wanted to make was this, right, that you can see a lot of the reasons why pundit shows suck is because they're, they have to put on a show every night, right? Chris Matthews has to go on air every night and he has to fill an hour and make all these things. I, but there seems to me to be a different motivation behind some of these other sorts of media. So ta has written on his blog about how a lot of the reasons for the blog is not filling <laughs> column inches or the advertising revenue that isn't coming in clicks per minute um, or clicks per view. Um, but just because it helps develop a con an idea in conversation with your readership, right? And that you're writing because you're working through an idea and you want to think it. That seems to me to be fundamentally different for whatever people end up doing with it than the industrial uh, context of filling time to sell ads to people, filling time to, s to do something else where you have these other constraints that are guiding how long your work is, how short it is, and when you need to get it out. The effects may or may not be different. But I was wondering if any of you have an idea of a potential shift from here are some ideas I'm working through uh, or, or towards that from here is time or space I need to fill, uh, if any different results might emerge. I, I mean, I, I s still want to push back against the, the, uh, the, the <laughs> underlying notion there. I, I think the reason why people read newspapers, and even the reason why people read punditry shows is because they want narratives to help them understand the world. Um, 
you know, if, if, if I'm reading a story, if, I, if I'm reading about today's Red Sox game, it's not because I want to talk about it. It's because it was incredibly painful, and I want a narrative that is going to help me understand that. Um, uh, and also, you know, if I'm if I'm reading about what's going on around the world, it's because I want both want a narrative to help me understand the world, and also because as a citizen of the world, I want to be well informed. I, it's not because. Um, uh, I'm, I'm either looking to fill time or hope that I have something to drop into conversation. Um, so, but I, I, I'd be interested in, in hearing both of your thoughts about that. You write for the Daily Beast. I don't know if you would, if you consider that column writing or blogging. But Tanasi, you obviously blog, and I think that that the idea that you're talking about is. Um, I'm not sure if it's a new form of journalism, but. You know, uh, it's almost something that Andrew Sullivan helped foster on his site early on, which is a, you use a blog to develop your thinking, to develop um, uh, your perspective on a situation, and it's more of a two-way conversation. Right. Yeah. I, I, um, why well, just to get back? I'm going to push back on Seth's pushback. Let <laughs> uh, defend Chris here for a moment. Uh, it might be helpful to uh, disentangle like what media you're talking about. You know, I, I, if you're picking up sure. the New York Times, um, you probably are less apt to be trying to fill your time. No one reads an 8,000 word New Yorker feature necessarily to, to 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 fill their time. I mean, that's that's some something more that you want. I don't know about like I think TV is fundamentally different. Right. I think yeah, yeah. People do come home, have a hard day, and I do think for a lot of people, politics. It certainly was for me. Before I threw out my TV, <laughs> um, and even now, you know, I'll boot up whatever you know on the computer and go do you know whatever you know lazy thing I'm doing. You know, um, eat my dinner or, or, or whatever. Um, so I, I do think for TV is 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 much uh, closer to this notion. Of, of, of filling your time, then the commitment that, that, that reading takes, whereas you, know, you can't do anything else. Um, in, in terms of the second part, um, this for me goes back to the whole notion of, of objectivity. Um, and when you say this goes back, you mean the idea of working out something yes. in, and, and letting the public see your yes. intellectual process of Yes, because out. I think uh, for journalists, for quote unquote thought leaders, for public intellectuals, the uh, template has long been, I am an expert in this, and you should listen to me because of that. Right. Um, and you're talking about news and opinion. Yeah, I think just across the board, and I think even at, at universities, I think anybody you know, who had some sort of platform in which they were granted the ability to talk to large groups of people, um, that what they, expertise was how they build themselves in general. Um, there are probably exceptions to that that other people here might be able to bring up. Um, I never felt like an expert. I, I, I felt really, really curious, uh, and I just, I, I, I don't know. I, for me, like the fundamental motivation uh, for journalism was curiosity, period. Um, uh, you know, just an insatiable curiosity. Um, and that's more what, what, what I stress, you know, that, that, that I am in pursuit. And that's why you come, you know, uh, under the hope that I won't just stop at something easy. I won't just stop at something I mean, that's why you come to your blog. That's why a reader will come to you. I, I, I hope so. I hope so. That I'll keep asking questions. Because that's what, I, I can only say that that was how I always worked on stories. You know, I mean, this goes from when I first started. It was, you know, uh, are you going to ask the question after the question after the question after the question? Are you going to keep pushing? You know, uh, it was that you wanted to know. And so, I, you know, I worked for 12 years before I started blogging. When I started blogging, the notion was to then open that up, right. to then let you know, the person see you doing that. Um, but that was where I thought journalism came from anyway. You know, it was this notion that you, know, you went in, you dropped in, and often you, you know, weren't an expert, but you asked, 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 asked. That's just great. It's a really good question. Uh, um, from my perspective, I think that uh, that ties in a little bit to my whole no labels effort and kind of the conversations that we're having, which again are you know uh, we're not trying to claim all the answers. You know, we're we're trying to create a a collective dialogue and a dynamic by bringing people together. So uh, you know that that's that's where I see things shifting and the dynamic changing and, and getting some traction for that because I think that. I, I think there's a there's a growing appetite for that that we're we're trying to throw a net around. So uh, it's it's a it's a really interesting thought. 
before we get to Tom, I, I, I'm actually curious. I, I think that um, the motivation that you're talking about is the motivation for a lot of journalists. And maybe even, right. I mean, I was, I was reading today uh, um, John McPhee talking about his career and, right. and what motivates him. And right. essentially, is, you know, there's something he doesn't know anything about, and he right. wants the answers. And he's lucky enough to be in a position where he can ask them until he gets them. Right, 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 right. Um, uh, no, I totally agree with that. But if you um, cannot stay the same way if you're on the uh, <laughs> campaign trail for eight months, is that, is that really what, what, what you mean? What, can that stay the same way? Do you continue to have that is it same appreciation for what you don't know? Yeah, yeah. Can, can it be that way? I mean, is, that, is it really curiosity at that point right. that, that is really motivating you if you're, you know, and again, going back to this notion of how much is really actually happening. Yeah, right. You know, how, how much of that can, can be sustained? Right. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, because you've been there, but you know, there's really nothing more boring than being on a modern day presidential campaign <laughs> in terms of anything happening that's interesting or different or mm -hmm. surprising. Covering baseball might be <laughs> more boring. Tom? Yeah, I'm, um, thank you, uh, uh, everybody, for, for, for bringing this to the People's Republic of Cambridge. Um, <laughs> and I don't think any. Any visit here, uh, Mark, would be complete without a little pushback. Um, so I've got, I guess, one quick comment and then two questions. One is, the comment is obviously that, that partisanship is not obligately a bad thing, uh -huh. you know? Yep. Um, and that the quest for bipartisanship um, is often a way to mask um, uh, a sort of a short circuiting of democracy in the in the solution of contentious problems, you know. So I think that there is a a, a premise behind some of what you said. And, Wait, and I'm some sorry, you, a short circuit. Yeah, I mean, say if if you know, politics are composed of elites and you know, popular or or mass involvement, and uh, bipartisanship is a tool that can be used, and I'd argue has been a lot in the last many years uh, by political elites to short circuit discussions about, for example, tax policy or all kinds of things. I mean, you can run down a long list. Um, uh, you know, we have an elite consensus on the way we should deal with antitrust law that leads to, among other things, enormous media conglomerates that make it harder and harder to have a vibrant media ecosystem or extremely large. You know, I mean, there are all kinds of things. You can get very nitty gritty into details like that or you can get into, into some of the more um, sort of grand or thematic issues in which a bipartisan consensus is actually a mask right. for ways that the people don't get, get onto things. Um, but I guess uh, I was a little bit troubled during your, a couple of your remarks um, when you supplied examples of, you know, the Romney campaign ad and the Obama ad and um, the uh, Bush, uh, with, you know, which says cha challenging on the Bush um, uh, recount versus the uh, birther crisis that you were at least tiptoeing around the edges of false equivalency. Um, as I recall, uh, when the, the campaign was done and people, the various uh, fact checkers looked at, for example, how many Romney ads were, were bogus or, or mostly bogus or Pinocchio or whatever the things were versus the Obama ads, the Romney campaign uh, was in, in, in much more dubious shape when it came to truth telling. And that's a distinction that's important, because if, if one side of the partisan debate divide is more committed to a reckless disregard of the truth, we've got a real problem, if only because of the political equivalent of Gresham's law, where, where you know, bad money drives out good and bad campaigning, bad, bad information drives out good information. Um, so I wondered, you know, I want to give you a chance to either... Well, I don't disagree them. with that. Okay. And I, I don't disagree with that. So what do you do about a political culture in which one party is continuing to maintain a great deal of power over the current political process despite a wavering commitment to truth-telling? Well, the particular party that you're talking about in this instance lost a presidential election. They, yeah. There was a consequence. <laughs> yeah, but they retained the House with, in ways that look not permanent but, but lasting. Well... You know, voters can vote them out. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's what democracy's all about. Mm. Well, there, there is, you, I, I, I take... Well, I'm, I'm well, all yeah, for, yeah, listen, yeah. I'm all for reforms. That, that I, I don't like the yes. gerrymandering that goes on that creates mm -hmm. protected districts and all of that. But, you know, I, 
It is the system we have. And I'll, I'll, you know, let me just put one more thing to you, because because you you noted that in partisanship in Washington is at least partly driven by partisanship in the country and the siloed nature of, of our social life and all that. Right. And I'm sure that's true, but there's also been a lot of political science recently on the impact of leaders on followers' opinions. Um, one of the big case studies has been looking at attitudes about global warming, which is, which is a subject I've been covering since the, um, since the 80s. Um, and you see a really major change starting around the time that uh, George W. Bush became president when Republican leaders who had been, you know, Republicans and Democrats had equal, had, had similar disagreement within the parties about the severity, importance, and human causation of global warming prior to that. After that, as Democrats and the scientific community became increasingly convinced of the reality of the problem, um, Republicans increasingly opted for the, you know, uh, the the, the skept so-called skeptical side, mm -hmm. and popular opinions, which had been overwhelmingly uh, in support of the idea that global warming was a problem and we need to take action, shifted dramatically with Republican-identified voters following Republican leaders. There's been other studies similar to this. Um, and I suppose that's something that you may be trying to address with your current efforts, but it certainly suggests that the decisions and information choices and choices about whether or not to be honorable truth-telling politicians at the top matter for the partisanship issue that you seem to be very concerned with. Well, and before you answer, let me, because I don't want you to need to say this. So, I mean, I think that um, I don't want Mark to become a surrogate for GOP efforts more generally. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, regardless of your view about specific campaigns, um, uh, and I've known Mark in different capacities um, for several years and interacted with him as a journalist and a source, you know, 12 years ago or 13 years ago. Um, and he has legitimately always been someone who um, pushed back against that within his own party. I don't know if that was also true when you were a member of the Democratic Party. Um, and certainly, I think, in the last couple of years, has even more vocally, since you have been unaligned with campaigns. Well, if I, I'm, not, I'm sorry. If I, if I came off as ad hominem, I, I certainly don't no, mean no, that. No, no, no. But I, 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 you know, the question is, if the, if the problem is excess of partisanship and a decline in truth-telling and the awareness of truth by the electorate, then the question is, what are the solutions? And if the issue is one of leadership voices driving that, that suggests different solutions than if the issue is a siloed media environment, for example. You know, if Mitt Romney went out there and said, in fact, I've spent some time on it, I've had, I've had, I've had some spare time, and, you know, I've really become uh, convinced global warming is a significant issue, anthropogenic global warming is a significant issue, that would, would or would not have an effect depending on how you view this question. So I guess the, the, the issue is, do we need to re-educate our leaders or do we need to break up our silos or, or, or you know? I think the leaders, uh, I think the leaders are feeding those silos, but uh, I also think that uh, you know, that, again, I go back to, you know, uh, you touched on it, but I mean, I spent a lot of time and a lot of column inches pushing back on the leadership of the Republican Party for precisely the reasons that you're talking about, and that's why I think the Republican Party's been in decline and will not reascend until it addresses that the problems like you've just pointed out. And uh, th this is... Uh, 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 so a very brief follow-up question to that. If Romney had come out, let's say, before he got the nomination and said, yes, the evidence, as, you know, Huntsman right. did to some degree and said that I think... By the way, John Huntsman is the co-chair of No Labels. Um, uh, but he said that... Along with know, Joe Manchin, who just was significant on the gun fight. The gun well. legislation. Um, if, if uh, you know, Huntsman did say, I think the Republicans seem to stand with science. Right. Um, if Romney had said that... Uh, now that's progress. ...during the primaries, <laughs> would he, would that have hurt his chance of gaining the nomination? I don't think so. You know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I believe and I've seen plenty of evidence over the years of campaigns that 
I think the big problem with Romney was much the same problem with Kerry, that people didn't believe that he believed what he was saying. Did and they believe that he believed what he was saying? No. Okay. No. I know. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I think that people will support somebody who they think has core convictions, even if they disagree with them, over somebody they agree with that thinks that they don't really believe it. So then I guess to get back to Tom's question, if, if we are in a situation in which, for one reason or another, we are uh, putting up for election leaders who don't have, don't seem to have core beliefs that they're willing to stand with, um, how does this cycle ever resolve itself? Well, I think. I mean, do you think that the crisis in the Republican Party after losing this election was sufficient that there will be a real change in that regard? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think the longer you spend in the desert, the more you figure out where the water is, and and you know, I, I think that. The, for example, I think the Republican Party could, could uh, support somebody who has those kind of bold convictions, like a Chris Christie, even though he may not be, you know, meet the 2008 primary purity test. You know, right. I, I think that that, you know, they're going to get to the point and say, well, you know, I like a guy who says what he believes and he's strong and he's bold and he's clear and he's and he's principled and he's consistent. Well, so one of the things that the GOP has been trying to do very actively um, since the campaign is broaden its appeal. Um, uh, Tom Hassey, we were talking a little bit just before we began about one of these efforts um, uh, when Rand Paul went to Howard and talked there. Uh, how did that play? <coughs> uh, not too well. Not too well. Um, I, it's, it's really sad uh, because uh, so uh, obviously folks looked at the, uh, the poll numbers and figured out that the Republican Party, Republican vote uh, from last election was overwhelmingly white. And overwhelmingly white in a way that it not necessarily uh, one would think that it shouldn't be. Uh, folks who, <clears throat> at least from the, you know, from the perspective of Republicans, should be allies or votes that they should be getting they did not get. Uh, Rand Paul, um, who I, I think actually could, you know, make inroads over a long-term period, someone like Rand Paul, uh, came to Howard University. And I, I was actually disappointed because I think there are some natural issues, not fake issues, real, real issues that he's actually spoken out on, for instance, prison reform, uh, uh, the war on drugs. I mean, these are actual issues that people in the African-American community are talking about. These aren't like, you know, fake sort of, you know, faux, People say things like, oh, the, the African-American community is, 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 is socially concerned, which is a big, broad sort of thing that might be true. But then, you know, when you start getting down to actual issues, drug wars, this is a real issue. Prison reform is a real, real issue that there's activism around, there's a base around, people are organizing it around, you could get votes around. And he spent three quarters or <laughs> half the speech lecturing an African-American audience on, on African-American history and the political parties. This is Howard University. Howard University is the mecca of Africa. I went to Howard University. I'll gladly tell you all about it. Howard University is the mecca of African American education. They call it the capstone of Negro education. That's what the name used to be. Um, there is a requirement that every student who comes into Howard has to take something out of the African American studies, African American history, African American <laughs> lit. I, I was joking with Seth. It would be like me uh, going to Paris and saying, I'm now going to give you a lecture on Vichy France, in English, by the way. <laughs> you know, and wondering, like, and expecting you to receive me well, like expecting to be, be well received. And I say all this to say, that what that points at is not even so much, you know, uh, problems with Rand Paul specifically, but you don't even know anyone to talk to, to tell you that this might be a bad idea. <laughs> that, that's a problem. That's a real, real, I mean, we start looking at, you know, we, we talk about votes. We talk about who's running. You know, is there going to be an, you know, other Republicans going to put up an African-American candidate? But the real issue is who's behind the scenes? How many contacts do you have? How often do you come in contact with African Americans, with Latinos, with Asian Americans, with gays, lesbians, people who are different than you? How, how much contact is there? I, I have this satirical letter I'm going to write to Rand Paul, but it actually is a very <laughs> serious letter. And if you look at uh, what the Obama coalition that, that he put together, to, this didn't happen overnight. 
This happened over a period of 40, 50 years, and there were nasty, really, really ugly, ugly battles behind the scene. Awkward moments that probably are much worse than what Rand Paul went, went through yesterday. But what counts is your willingness to have those fights, your willingness uh, uh, to have those. You mean with the, the Democratic Party building that coalition? Yes, 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 yes. Awkward moments between you know pulling those constituencies right. together. African Americans deeply skeptical. James Baldwin writes about this famous scene with, with Robert Kennedy. I mean, just really, really ugly, awkward, bad, bad moments between the Democratic Party and you know these various constituencies. What folks want is some sort of uh, uh, feeling that you're in for the fight. And when you don't care enough to even assemble people around you, to even you know, rub some elbows, even have some conversations before you decide to give a speech, I mean, what are folks left, left, left to conclude about right. that? It, it was deeply, deeply you know, depressing. Right. Sorry, that was my rant. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to ask a question that's a little bit of a <clears throat> meta question, I guess, a, an opportunity to reflect on the kind of conversation that I think has, we've been having today. And, um, I think it relates to an observation that I've been making or sort of just wondering about in conversations about journalism in general, so not just political journalism. But it seems to me like there are these sort of two strands of conversation about sort of where things are heading or or or, or what sorts of observations we can make as, as trends. Um, and the one side is that there's, there's a problem of the frag fragmentation of the sources of news or the audiences. And so that, you know, I think at one point in the conversation today, um, one of you was mentioning you know, people aren't getting the same narrative, they aren't, they aren't debating the same things, and, and that that could be an issue. And that's the more pessimistic side of, of the conversation. And on the other side, and I feel like these are the conversations that we maybe more often have, in, have, have here in CMS, there's the, the, the more optimistic opening of access, um, you know, people have more opportunities to be bloggers or to, you know, find channels through which they can communicate their ideas and there can be a more diverse set of ideas communicated as a result of, of greater access um, today. So there's this like very pessimistic and very optimistic side of the discourse. That I well, think. Are those, but are, why are those two things opposed to each other? <laughs> well, maybe they're not. I mean, what I'm asking, I guess, is sort of for your reflections on whether you agree that's a pattern and whether. I think my question when I hear those two sides um, of the discourse, <coughs> which come up quite often, is, you know, why is it that it seems to be so easy to look at for, in one direction and see one thing and another direction and see another thing? Like, is there something more fundamental under, underneath that we're not getting at when we have these kinds of conversations? You and know, it's a good question. I, 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 part of the problem may be that actually that, and we, were to, we talked a lot about truth, and what is the truth? Um, and maybe part of the problem is that with the additional information that we have and sort of, you know, people can get whatever information they want now, right? So if I'm inclined to believe one way or the other, and I'm going to be more righteous if I have what I think is my truth behind me. And that's kind of what I see in like the gun debate and stuff. You know, it's, it's uh, suddenly I'm finding myself having discussions with people where they've, They've, they're suddenly all telling me the same thing. So I know that they're sort of migrating to, and these are people from all over the place. It's like my cousin and, you know, it's not like suddenly they all got the same book, but somebody out there is like, you know, you know we know who that somebody is in this particular information, but like the NRA was like really in a manufactured way feeding this information in a very sophisticated way so that people thought they were getting the truth. You know, and then suddenly it becomes this collective truth so that's, that's, that's where it becomes problematic, I think, because people, you know, they have these, you know, it's not like the old days where there was kind of, you know, three networks with their version of the reality we started with. People, you know, migrate to, now they can go to wherever they want to to get their version of the truth, and they think it's true. Uh, so it, it's, it, uh, it, uh, I, mean, I guess that's the reason why I was saying I'm not sure why those two things are, are in opposition, because, um, uh, uh, a sense that we can create these information cocoons, I think, goes along very closely with um, the ways in which we are all able to generate information and put our opinions out there. Um, <coughs> the fact that there are more sources of information is one of the reasons why it is easier to create an information cocoon. And for the more sources of information to have 
um, uh, a positive effect on society as a whole, you need to have people in that society who are actively seeking out information that they might not agree with. And I think that's, a, that's in a lot of ways, goes against human nature. Well, I think maybe the tension in the question is we think, we generally think more information is a good thing. Right. And yet, <laughs> maybe it's not necessarily having good effects all Maybe the time. not. I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I do think that there's an assumption underneath both sides of this conversation that, you know, informa the, the point is to get at information. And as a historian of news, I think my question then becomes, well, you know, information itself is, and I don't want to start sounding like the people who were talking about those ads and saying, well, we don't need to care about facts or we don't need right. to care about reality, but at the same time, facts and information, these are historical categories as well, and they do depend on the types of, of, of media that, that, that are created to use them. And, you know, we didn't really have an idea of information and then leading to object Objectivity until um, objectivity until the early 20th century, and so it, it just makes me wonder if part of this debate needs to get at well, what do we mean when we even say information is 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 what fundamentally we, we need to be distributing? And you know, could it be that there's some combination of being much more upfront well, about? So do you are, do you think that that a that factual information is a construct? I think. It's tricky. I, I think that the concept of what a fact is is something that has changed over time, and I think that the concept of what information is is something that's been that's that's been built through history. And does that mean that there is no truth? No, not necessarily. I'm not saying that you know it's it's a, it should become a free for all, but I am saying that I feel like maybe part of what's happening is that there are standards that are shifting that you know, we, we still want to have some kind of standard. We want to have something to pin our news on. But could it be that we need to be thinking about a different, a different sort of underpinning? And just to give an a example. You I mean think, other than facts? <coughs> just to give an example, I think there was at one point in this conversation someone mentioned that you know, maybe we could be more upfront about the biases that we do bring uh -huh. to, to our stories. And is there some sort of combination of being more upfront about opinions and 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 more reflective about what a fact might be. I don't know. I mean, this is getting into a lot of speculation. I think my my point with the question was just trying to get at um, sometimes the 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 concept of information that's underneath the discourse is something that that perhaps we don't analyze enough, or or or, or not saying that we should necessarily, but but trying to bring that into the conversation of what's what's underneath. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 have a, I, I have a problem with the sort of postmodern notion that, that facts don't mean anything. Um, this is the tricky thing. I mean, I, I, I don't want to be standing here saying, I, I, right, that, that's not what I'm trying to say. And I don't think that. Certainly, I mean, so, yeah, certainly information <laughs> has, and, and how we value information has changed, what we consider information has changed, and, and the proliferation of, of, um, of news sources, of blogs, whatever, is one way that that's changed. Now, I can sit down on my computer for eight bucks, you know, put up a URL, write something down, and that's information, whereas five years ago, it just would have been me talking to myself in the corner. And, and that, 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 I think, has changed things in, in real ways. But I just want to be careful that we're not also saying that um, uh, the factual underpinning of what it is that I'm blathering about is mutable in that same way. Um, uh, you know, uh, Good you can you can and and let's take the birther example. You can disagree about whether Obama is a good president or whether he should have been elected or whatever, but um, you can't really disagree. Not really. You can't disagree about the fact that he was born in the United States. He's not a Nigerian foreign agent, whatever. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so I get uncomfortable when we start going down that sort of relativistic path. But, what? Yeah. That's, I think that's a little bit yeah, yeah. at that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Either you want to jump in there? Sorry, I didn't mean to. No. Yeah. Okay. I like facts. <laughs> I'm uh, Roger Wilson. I, uh, I want to ask, is it accurate to say that we're getting more partisan 
uh, party enrollments, I believe, are declining. The, 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 uh, the, the unenrolled numbers are increasing. So it seems to me we're getting less partisan. The parties are getting less effective at delivering votes. And it seems to me that there might be an opportunity uh, to deliver to citizens useful information to help them make voting decisions and other de decisions of citizenship that's not being met by the parties or the current uh, for-profit media. Well, the, the, and I'll, I'll let you also jump in there, but this, the, that does strike me as even in just the definition of partisan might be a little bit what you're talking about, because you can interpret partisan as meaning enrollment in political parties, or you can interpret it as the rhetoric that yeah. the Cam, the, the, that the candidates and campaigns are using. And uh, I think if you, depending on how you define partisan, you get two very different answers there. Yeah, uh, I, I, the, uh, I think that both can, ha I think both are happening. I think that, that, that you're right, that um, the uh, dedication to either party or allegiance has, has fallen off and people are increasingly less party loyal, uh, but at the same time, I think there is more partisan behavior that can be reflected in the rhetoric and the, the, the general debate uh, and, the, and the heat, uh, that, that, but, but I think both those things are true. We probably have time for one more Oh, sure. just a quick Question. point. Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, I th the other thing I think to recognize is uh, to the extent that and I'm not even sure she, but to, to the extent that this was a more bipartisan country or a less partisan country, it was always underwritten by a kind of uh, immoral consensus. Uh, one example of that immoral consensus is obviously segregation and Jim Crow. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a mistake that we've seen increased partisanship uh, since the Civil Rights Revolution. Uh, but it's not just that. I mean, it was the suppression of uh, gay and lesbian folks. It was uh, that women occupied a certain place in, in, in our society. Uh, a lot of the things that we had consensus on about how uh, a country should be organized have changed. Um, so if you're sitting in a seat like, like mine, um, this consensus was built on false things to begin with. Um, and to the extent that we're now fighting, um, the fight is a good thing for a lot of us. We've wanted to fight for a long time anyway. Hi, uh, I just have a quick question. You had mentioned the, about the Michelle Obama where they were just trying to hide the fact that you couldn't see her, you had to, they play, told you where you had to see her very specific. Yeah. And that David Carr had told you, you should write about this, why right. is this? And I guess I'm still curious. That never got answered. I I, so I, uh, I felt, you know, it's very interesting because I was thinking about like what reporters should do when they do that. I included virtually none of that. I included none of it in the story. Um, but I think that I, as, I think as a, a reader, I would want to know that. Right. That the campaign is doing it. <laughs> right. It's like, this is what's happening. Right. As a reporter, I'm experiencing right. all of this stuff. So right. I, I was given a t kind of a tough assignment. They didn't want to talk about race at all. And I was supposed to tell you what Michelle Obama meant. And you can't, I can't really tell you what Michelle Obama meant and not talk about race. So I went and talked to a bunch of other people. Um, but I, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, I guess in that sense, I didn't feel like I wasn't writing a process story. Um, I just felt like I didn't want any of that. I just didn't want, it wasn't part of what I was doing. I didn't want any of it in my story at all. Um, but, but your point's a good one. No, that, yeah. 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 All right, well, thank you guys, um, and, and, and thank uh, uh, both of you. I know both of you, you traveled here for this, which we appreciate. I know, ta you didn't travel somewhere, um, <laughs> uh, which um, we also really appreciate. This was a fascinating discussion. We, we did not get into Judy Collins at all, um, uh, but we certainly could have gone on um, for, for some time, and I suspect that we'll continue part of this next week, next Wednesday. Um, uh, so this was great. You know, these are, all, just as a f summary point, stating the obvious, I mean, I, I think that this conversation is, is a fascinating one, but I think it also reflects that we are really in the middle of all these 
big the, the, this revolution and you know fascinating and. Uh, you mean we're in the middle of this, not like we are in the middle of the action, but this revolution or this is unfolding yeah. as we speak. And yeah, yeah, and it's uh, and it's you know I, I think there's a lot of perspectives because it's well, there's a lot of things to shake out yet, and uh, um, and and I think that it could shake out really well and it could shake out really badly. Right, right, <laughs> right. All right, thank you guys.